So welcome, Warwick. Uh, welcome to the Groove Book Report. We're talking today about your new book, which is called uh, Fascinating History of Toys and Games Around the World, which has just been released. And I have to say it's a fairly comprehensive book um, with a New Zealand flavour, so well done on that. Um, what brought you to write this book? Well, it was one of those things that I've been working on, I suppose, in my mind for many years. When, uh, back in 95 and to 97, I curated a major touring uh, show, two museum shows, two actually, one called The Toy Show and one called The Game Show, which uh, was uh, were collections of international toys and games and uh, really to show how they reflect history and, uh, and sort of, I guess, the artistic qualities and sculptural qualities of the work as well and just the uh, fact that there's a lot more, I think, to toys than, um, than people think. Yeah, and I noticed that uh, your your background itself is uh, is more in the art space. So I guess you would look at these from an artistic curatorial place, um, as well as a kind of ephemera type sort of thing. But you're into yeah. the backstories to these, like art itself, like paintings and sculptures. Would that be right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, even as a child, I can remember being read to. Uh, by my parents, because I, I do talk a lot of, in my book about how books also influenced uh, history and um, and toy making, and I can remember you know kids, parents reading books to me, and I was more fascinated by the illustrations than perhaps the stories, and it just absolutely uh, has been something that's been a common denominator through my whole sort of collecting, which started really when I was a child. It was just the, the um, even the graphics on tin plate toys. And as you say, the sculptural qualities of uh, many toys, one of the first that I I bought, I guess, when I really started getting into collecting seriously was when I was in my early 20s and came across a cast iron toy in a, in a second-hand shop. And you know, to me, it was just like a sculpture. And uh, that sort of really set me off into sort of saying, hey, what... what what else is out there in the big wide world that I don't know about? Yeah, this was a car, a Pontiac, I believe. Is that right? That's right. It was just a, only a small car, believe it or not. That's only four and a half inches long. It was a cast iron made in 1936 by an American maker. And I was quite influenced. Um, at that same time, I came across a book written by a, an American um, author and poet uh, called Ken, um, Ken Botto. And he was a... Um, unbeknown to me, a great toy collector, and he wrote a book called Past Joys, and he uh, set up dioramas, was his sort of thing, really, more than anything, but that book really uh, inspired me to sort of branch out, and even eventually, soon after, go to America and see what was there. Yeah, then it seems that uh, that's just like an open book, really. Um, anybody who watches those antique road shows and American Packers and all those TV shows that are currently on uh, TV, particularly on Sky TV at the moment, is, is just endless what you can find. Oh, look, things seem to I know. run around. <laughs> um, look, yeah, I know, and that, those sort of things are, you know, sort of make it a lot easier, I guess. With the, and the e-commerce markets now make it so much easier for collectors to collect things, whereas back in the sort of 70s and 80s. I was really just corresponding with collectors and even even auction houses there just by uh, by mail, and the sent people were sending photos back and forward because it wasn't really till the late nineties that um, I think uh, eBay started around about that two thousand period and paid me. Mm. So before that, it was uh, pretty much uh, analog and hands on sort of thing, tracking down the toys. In fact, Ken Botto, remember his famous quote where he said that. Um, you know, he was so obsessed with collecting toys, he, he became a, 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 a toy junkie, always on this crazy search for his next toy fix. <laughs> and, and that sort of can, can sort of, uh, something that, you know, obsessive collectors can really relate to. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there's that nostalgic aspect to collecting as well, of course, which is often a, um, a you know, a sort of prime mover for a lot of collectors of various, various things. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because there is, um, I guess, in the in the sort of the, uh, the the toy sculpture space, there seems to be um, a number of different things. There's the there's the antique sort of very old toys that that come about, which are pretty much falling apart these days. I guess the sort of small cars and whatever. Then you get things like particular manufacturers, like Matchbox, for example. Um, and then you get the new uh, Star Wars toys. One of them, I can't believe, went for such a high price. <laughs> I used to own one like that, damn it. <laughs> uh, the Ben uh, Kenobi, what was it, 35000 or 75000 or something? $76,000. Yeah, that's just 
one example of you know, some of the prices that they have been fetching. That's right. And now we've also got um, new toys which have been coming out, uh, the resin toys, which are manufactured for no other purpose but to be collected and to never be opened or unboxed at any stage. Those, uh, yeah. those interesting ones. And that's a whole space in itself, which you don't touch on in your book, but I, I imagine you're probably looking at it as a future thing. Those are the future antiques, do you think? Look, I think that's possibly that is a um, an aspect of collecting for some people. Certainly not so much for me, but you know, it, what, that's one of the things that I've really become aware of in, in America and Europe is that there are serious collectors who have got endless amounts of money, and they actually some of them do actually buy for investment. And I mean, I always quote the, um, the Don Don Kaufman, who was one of the major toy collectors in, in the world in America, who passed away a few years ago. And he'd been collecting pretty much since the 60s and had probably an example of every major sort of type of antique toy from, say, the 19th century in Europe right through to, to around about, say, the 1970s. Mm. But when that um, collection was sold off, which took three auctions to sell off in America, it fetched $12.5 million. Wow. So there are people who um, do that. And I remember a big collector in America one stage, he went about putting together a collection of um, robots. And this is battery-operated robots from Japan, um, which are really a sort of golden age of sort of battery-operated and tin-plate toys that came about uh, you know, after the Second World War. And at that stage, people necessarily weren't thinking robots or tin-plate toys from Japan were going to be worth any money, really. Uh, they were just toys. But he put together a, a whole collection, and these were sold for... I think over a million dollars, uh, and he paid, you know, several thousand for the toys initially, overall. So I mean, and he had put it together. He, he looked at it as, as an investment, mm. but that's not certainly the reason I collect. And, and generally speaking, it's not the reason most people collect um, at all. Mm. Yeah, these are amazing. I just flicked open to the book, and what should I see here is uh, one that is probably. Uh, I guess um, representative of one of the chapters you've got here is there's, there's Robbie the Robot from Lost in Space here in 1997. I've actually got that very one sitting on my desk at work here today. Really? Yeah, it's a bit of a treasure of mine. I hope I hope it's a genuine uh, original one. <laughs> there are a lot of reproductions made, but yeah. you know the genuine ones are worth you know well hundreds and thousands of dollars. You know, like, oh my goodness! Uh, I don't know. It's a it's a 1997 model. I guess would be okay. about right. No, that'll, so yeah, that'll replay, be yeah. yeah. That'll be repo, but you know it's a it's a classic toy, and uh, you know that's a classic example too of a toy that represents a certain era as well. Once again, the sort of Japanese tin plate toys, but you know that was born out of the um, the first space movies and the first yeah. movies that had robots in them. And, and uh, but don't they also uh, represent that, a certain art form as well? I mean, to come up with a, a design absolutely. like that, which is just yes. so creative in its own sense, yep. it's like the imagination. Yeah. Of, yeah, and installing a character with an, an inanimate object must have been um, something that, you know, was real imagination uh -huh. at work there. Yeah, no, that's so true. And that, that really does sum up a lot of what the book's about as well, where these ingenious uh, toy makers, but also, as you say, the designers. And people, and one of the, the themes of the book, too, is also the fact that books have inspired a lot of um, toys or be, uh, form the genesis of toy making and, and the space sort of toy genre is very much an example of that where you had Jules Verne with his um, book written in 1860 uh, from the Earth to the Moon and H.G. Wells, uh, you know, War of the Worlds in 1898. Now that, there was a movie, first one of the first movies ever made was uh, inspired by, um, by the, those two books yes. and from there you had TV serials which sort of uh, radio serials that came about in the 20s and 30s and then you had the first space toys uh, that started coming out, which were born out of those serials. Then you had the space race in the 1950s, and of course that um, just provided a mother load of toys, uh, you know, for the for the world. And as you say, the the ingenious design, they're, they're absolutely you know classic, and that's why they're worth so much money today. I guess in some ways they also represent um, design styles of the times, like uh, the Art Deco period and the toys that followed off that. And um, and then there were there were some toy manufacturers who used their imagination and went off on various tangents with what they were doing. And then you get ones like, I again go back to Matchbox, who actually wanted to duplicate, ex and Dinky for that matter, wanted to duplicate exactly what the thing looked like down to its 
as minute detail yeah. as possible. Yeah, well, that's one of the, the fun things of collecting. I mean, my collection really has always been very, I guess you could say, eclectic. It's so wide ranging, you know, from um, you know from dime store or um, cereal toys <laughs> with a dollar to you know quite um, expensive and valuable tin plate toys from the 1930s of classic cars. But you're right in what you say about how there's been whole uh, movements reflected through toys in, in the first chapter of the book. An actual fact is um, one which is called Fun and Serious Games in the Pyramids, and that's really where the, the book starts with toys that were discovered in the in the pyramids. And, yeah. Well, and pretty much it talks about how the, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922 sort of sparked, that, as you say, a whole genre and design movement which which carried on again or was revived again when the um, those museum pieces toured the world, in particular America, and, and it revived it, the Art Deco sort of period and style and uh, and also Tutankhamun's objects, and there was toys, new toys made uh, directly as a result of that um, touring exhibition in, um, in America. Yeah, tell me about Tutankhamun's one. There's a, there's a picture in your book of a, a kind of a table uh, which surprised me immediately. I was thinking, oh, they had tables back then, but it, it's a it's a specific <laughs> type of gaming table. What What is yeah. that about? It looks like a game not unlike chess or checkers or something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that arguably is probably one of the most valuable toys in the world, in actual fact, and that was discovered in Tutankhamun's uh, tomb in 1922, and nobody um, really knew what that game was, but uh, Howard Carter worked worked um, worked out what it was, and it was a game called Senate, which is um, a game that is sort of very much reflective of the whole sort of culture, Egyptian sort of culture, whereby you, you played the game and you passed. You won, If you won, you passed into the afterlife. That was what it was all about. Ah. But it was played by everyone and anyone. It was as common as probably you know, trivial disputes or monopoly uh, in, 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 in that day, way back 5,000 years ago. But that is like a, a toy that was made um, with, with great skill, it's, it's ebony and ivory. It had ivory playing pieces. Well, in fact, it's got ivory playing pieces in the picture, but the originals uh, were lost. And, and Howard Carter speculated that they probably were, were originally silver and gold. But some of the uh, the wall paintings found in pyramids earlier, some of the historians actually um, incorrectly identified the game as chess. But uh, it's since been found to be that it wasn't, and it's this game Senate. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the beautiful backgammon sets that, that can be collected now. Uh, That's of, right. Know, that much effort that went into these pieces were as much uh, treasure as they were game. Yeah, well, it is, a, I guess, a similar sort of game to backgammon in a way, but but different again. But, um, you know, that game was, as I say, revived uh, in the 70s, and there's a lot of, sort of reproduction games. on. You can still buy them today oh. of that actual game. So um, I'll have to go digging around. Now, was there really a, a game about an atom bomb that children could use to destroy <laughs> cities? That sounds like a version of Risk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just a difficult sort of oddball game, that the sort of thing that I'd spot and... and and think that that's weird and strange, and it would be a good thing to put in a book because it's not something generally people would ever buy, um, and it's not worth anything. You know, I think it cost me twenty dollars or something like that. But it's once again reflective of a period of history and time when, uh, and, and I mean, you'd never think a game like that would even be made. It was made in England in 1950, and um, at a time, of course, when the Cold War era sort of started. And people I wouldn't have thought would have been um, too interested in playing a game where you chuck that and bombs <laughs> around the place. <laughs> um, so to me, that it's sort of an example of a game that's sort of it's it's strange and um, I guess a bit of a or not an anachronism, but sort of a, a paradox or of, of something that you'd think you know why would someone want to play it? And I suggested it might be a good sort of thing to hand out to world leaders if they ever get itchy fingers on buttons. Have a go at playing this game and see how you feel in half an hour and go back to the real world. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever come across one, but it, it did remind me there's a, there was an obscure um, 80s American band, uh, thrash metal band called Huskadu or Huskadu, and that was based off a, of a, a Swedish game called You Will Remember, which has also had the name Huskadu or Huskadu. Um, I don't know where that came from, but uh, I've seen images of the original game, and it's uh, got two children who 
essentially look like they're trying to remember something or you know it's a card right. game on uh, it's a card board game i don't know if you've ever come across that one no no i haven't but there is there is all sorts of strange games out there i mean one of the interesting aspects too for me in toy collecting has been how they reflected all the different sort of materials that have been used in the last 200 mm. years pretty much sort of post-industrial revolution because there have been all sorts of strange materials used to make toys and they were used often experimentally experimentally because people thought well, we didn't make a car part with that or we didn't make a kid's child seat with it or something that might uh, you know, might kill someone so we'll make a few toys and see how it goes and uh, and a lot of us are in the um, well, I'm not sure it's in the um, chapter called uh, Early Plastics, um, Early Period Plastics and Late Period Plastics, because this is when, even even back in the mid-19th century, people were very concerned about the fact that elephants were actually in danger of extinction because mm-hmm. they were just being so obliterated due to the ivory poaching, yes, particularly in, in Africa mm-hmm. and even, and of course, in China. And eventually... Um, Celluloid was invented in the uh, mid uh, 19th century, and of course, from there, that became the genesis of plastics. But I guess, ironically, now plastics are sort of the enemy. But I mean, they, it was a wonder invention, and it's uh, you sort of think, well, what's the alternative to plastic in a way? I think you can sort of think that's what I think that's a great thing. And toys do make you think about things, and I sort of think, okay, well, I can remember in the 60s uh, when I was sort of growing up in the hippie era that using Timber for sort of paper and uh, you know cardboard that, that was sort of almost started to be frowned upon. Uh, everyone wanted to keep the world green, and it wasn't a good thing to start chopping trees down for uh, paper. And I was sort of encouraged to you know use plastic materials. Ah, isn't now, that funny? We've turned the full circle, isn't it? You know, it's so, it um, yeah. Um, it did. It does kind of make me wonder, though. I mean, uh, most most children that grew up in the 1930s would have had lead soldiers, and you think how much of <laughs> those soldiers actually ended up in, in babies' mouths and, and various things like that. And, of course, we know that that was very dangerous at its time. But uh, yeah. uh, And then, of course, um, that leads nicely on to New Zealand manufacturers. One of them is still going in Inglewood, at least as a museum. Uh, that's the Fun Ho Factory, which I visit every time I'm in the Taranaki area. <laughs> okay, oh, <laughs> One great. One of my favourites. Uh, I've got many pieces that I've uh, picked up there, mostly reproduction. Oh, excellent. Now. But, um, yeah, it's still going. Um there, were there any other New Zealand manufacturers apart from Fun Ho, who made mostly in aluminium, well, didn't they? Yes, well, it was. I mean, I have actually devoted a whole chapter to, um, well, it's called Enduring Folk Art, Dream Cars and Toys in Aluminium. I, I guess it's probably the first book that has actually um, talked about toys that are made in aluminium, and, I, and I've claimed in the book that Fun Ho or Underwood Engineering are probably in actual fact the most significant manufacturer in the world of toys from aluminium mm. because they started in the 1940s and pretty much continued to the, the mid-80s making um, toys out of aluminium and, and really you can probably say they're, they're indestructible which uh, and there's probably not a lot of other toys that are completely indestructible because even cast iron is actually quite brittle and fragile if you sort of chuck it at uh, somebody or drop it on the concrete. So they're one, and I think you can still buy. Um, they're still doing some reproduction, so you can, in fact, still buy, um, you know, buy some Funho toys. Yeah, and that is a huge amazing. collecting field now. Um, there's a lot of collectors of Funho toys, and I've sort of been collecting them for a long time too. But there are other makers. I mean, one of the companies that's still going, probably one of the fewest only New Zealand companies that were operating before the Second World War was Thomas Holdsworth, who make uh, you know games and jigsaw puzzles and things like that. And they're they a survivor. Um, they were sort of operating under the protection of import license, uh, licensing sort of during the 50s and 60s, mm. making, uh, you know, games and puzzles. But they still make the puzzles. And there's quite a few early um, jigsaw puzzles in, in the book, some made by them, because once again, they reflect history. There's jigsaw puzzles made of cruise ships and liners. And there's one there. Mm. And they were put in the book of Cardigan Bay, who was a very famous New Zealand uh, trotter or pacer. Yes. Who, you know, was the first horse in the world to win a million dollars. And there's a jigsaw puzzle in there. And, and that, that's the sort of thing that the book's about, where there's toys that, you know, reflect and, and tell us something about history. So this is and the I've tried to put, company, um, that you're talking about? Yes, Holson's, yeah. Yes. And I've oh, tried to put a lot of New Zealand toys in. Yeah. They made the jackpot racing. Yeah. And once again, that's... Uh, 
you know, that's uh, that's a sort of reflective of a happy memory for me, yeah. going at once to the uh, races in Avondale and actually winning a jackpot uh, with, <laughs> with one of the New Zealand crickers at the time who I, I'd known and played with. And uh, that was an Avondale race course. So that that was sort of another sort of phenomena that is no longer. I mean, you can still take a pick six, and I think but it's a different to exchange. Uh, and the one, one that, the uh, I, yeah, I had to jump in here. The one I see you've got a uh, an image of a, a horse. Uh, what is it? Um, a trotting one. Is is that was that based on Cardigan Bay as well? Which, that's Cardigan uh, Bay. Yeah. yeah, and that's um, just for just for listeners' benefit. That is actually um, set up like a like a slot car set, isn't it? Oh well, okay, the slot car set. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure if that would actually be. You know, that's obviously a generic toy, mm. probably of paces, but it was put out at a time when when Cardigan Bay was uh, in its prime and peak yeah. and. Uh, went to America, and it's quite unusual insofar as, as you say, normally the slot car sets were really popular then, but they, they put one out with, with trotters in it, which, uh, which is rather unusual, but it's quite a beautifully uh, made toy. It has too, it's got, a, it's got the sulky, it's got the horse, it's got the ride, yes. it's got everything, I mean, if I, I'd love to have that just as a kind of art piece. Really. <laughs> well, you, cool. it's funny you should say that, because only yesterday, a lady of all things said to me, she was looking at the book uh, down at the, um, the, the paper plus drawer, in St. Helens, and she, she said, that's just absolutely beautiful. I love that toy. <laughs> you know, and I've sort of liked it myself, but never sort of thought you know, it'd be something that someone would really sort of choose against others. But it is a beautifully made uh, toy, and I think it's quite rare. I'd, I've, uh, I've never seen it before or since I sort of grabbed it when it came up for sale, because uh, it is quite beautifully made. One of the ones, I guess, um, we, we could talk all for hours, but one of the things I did want to ask you about is what's happened to tra- model train sets? I mean, I had one when I was a little boy, and that, I had a Markham train set, and that was that was only in oh, okay. the 80s. So, yeah, well, they yeah. just seem to have that just seems to have all gone, unfortunately. That was a combination yeah. of model making and dioramas and things. Is it just that we just don't have time for this stuff anymore? Well, I guess they are, you know, reflective of changing times. Because as you say, I mean, every kid I knew and when I grew up, we all had a train set. We all wanted a train set, mm. and they were sort of reflective, very much of, I guess transport and, and travel and journeys, um, you know, cars, I've got a chapter called um, Trains and Boats and Planes. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, as you say, um, trains, while they're, you know, sort of an important form of travel and transport, uh, they've probably lost a lot of their, um, well, I guess, as you know, so quite of, <laughs> trains are not quite the same. And... Uh, they're pretty people these days, days aren't they? <laughs> well, like, yeah. yeah there's, I mean, some of them are quite beautiful. I mean, the bullet trains and some of the trains I've seen true. in magazines. But but you, you're right. That, see, I, I don't think anyone did everyone ever throw away their trains yet because there's a lot of them come on the market now in the big toy auctions internationally. And yes, some still fetch fifty thousand dollars and a hundred thousand dollars. But generally speaking, from what I've seen. The market is very flat for train sets because they're, they're all still out there. There's mm. thousands and thousands still out there that date back to the, even the 19th century. Um, but people still collect uh, trains, but you're right, it is probably a, one a, a area of antique toys that's probably um, quite flat. 